Quem tem uma empresa sabe quanto tempo é valioso. Por isso, a Pets Brasil apoia empresas brasileiras que querem exportar seus produtos, atrair investimentos estrangeiros ou empreender no exterior. Com a Apex Brasil, as empresas brasileiras têm um apoio estratégico para mandar seus produtos e serviços para fora do país de uma forma inteligente e segura. Com métodos inovadores, parcerias, soluções inteligentes, visão de mercado, conteúdos estratégicos e muita qualificação, a Apex Brasil é referência na promoção de exportações, internacionalização de empresas e atração de investimentos estrangeiros. A agência também atua de forma coordenada com atores públicos e privados em setores estratégicos, tanto para o desenvolvimento da competitividade das empresas quanto para o fortalecimento da economia brasileira. Se é conexão com o um mundo de oportunidades no mercado internacional que a sua empresa procura, é o apoio da Apex Brasil que ela precisa. Acesse o mundo. Acesse Apex Brasil.
Quem tem uma empresa sabe quanto tempo é valioso. Por isso, a Apex Brasil apoia empresas brasileiras que querem exportar seus produtos, atrair investimentos estrangeiros ou empreender no exterior. Com a Apex Brasil, as empresas brasileiras têm um apoio estratégico para mandar seus produtos e serviços para fora do país de uma forma inteligente e segura. Com métodos inovadores, parcerias, soluções inteligentes, visão de mercado, conteúdos estratégicos e muita qualificação. A Apex Brasil é referência na promoção de exportações, internacionalização de empresas e atração de investimentos estrangeiros. A agência também atua de forma coordenada com atores públicos e privados em setores estratégicos, tanto para o desenvolvimento da competitividade das empresas quanto para o fortalecimento da economia brasileira. Se é conexão com o mundo de oportunidades no mercado internacional que a sua empresa procura, é o apoio da Apex Brasil que ela precisa. Acesse o mundo. Acesse a Apex Brasil. Welcome back. Good morning and afternoon to all. I am Renato Godinho. I lead the Division for Energy Progress in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Brazil. And in that capacity, I have been privileged to serve as the chairperson for the BioFuture platform, helping to fulfill Brazil's role as the lead country in the platform for the current two-year mandate. This is a great day for the platform as we are holding the online segment of the second edition of the BioFuture Summit Conference. For this edition, We were extremely fortunate to partner with SBBQ and the FAPES Bioenergy Program, the minds behind the widely known BeBest Bioenergy Technology Conference, Apex Brazil and others to hold a joint conference that provides the most value for delegates from all over the world. As an important sample of the wide and deep ranging panels planned for the full conference in May 2021 in Sao Paulo, I am glad to introduce this online mini policy forum in which we are receiving experts from the IEA, Brazil, Europe, the United States to bring their different perspectives and experiences to try to answer one question. If we had to choose, what is the single most important policy that governments can deploy to break the barriers, overcome the obstacles and finally unlock the investments and increase production and use that we need for the sustainable low carbon bioeconomy. As we have listened from the high level authorities in our opening ceremony earlier today, bioenergy is key to the global energy transition efforts. As all previous inquiries by the BioFuture platform and as a wide number of experts, industry representatives and international organization reports have shown, this sector is policy driven as it has important positive externalities that need to be properly recognized and new technologies that have to be incentivized by policy in order to reach scale and compete with long-established fossil fuel industries. 
that much is already quite consensual. We need policies, but which policies, which instruments are the best and most efficient to apply for any given context, for any given national situation? What are the mistakes to avoid and what are the successes to learn from? Work is ongoing by the Biofuture platform on what we are calling the Biofuture Policy Blueprint, which will try to consolidate some answers to those questions by means of a close examination of actual evidence and ongoing policy experiments in the field. To bring you some little light about this ongoing work and to discuss perspectives from different policy experiments and paths, I'm very happy to leave you in the competent hands of BioFuture Platform core group member, Dr. K. Squant from the government of the Netherlands whose deep experience in the field of bioenergy will help him and help us as he will be the moderator to this key panel. Mr. Pont, the floor is yours to conduct the panel. Thank you very much for accepting this role. Thank you very much, uh, Renato, for these kind words and also to the BioFuture platform for the invitation to me to moderate uh, this session on uh, policies. Um, we have been deeply involved in policies over the past. Uh, I am working at uh, the Ministry of Economic Affairs and Climate in the Netherlands at the Netherlands Enterprise Agency, where we execute actually these policies. And uh, it has been a lot of discussion has been uh, given to how to realize policies. So this policy, let's say, debate that we will have here comes at the right moment. We are having, uh, let's say, discussions within Europe on the Red 2. We are having also discussions nationally because we have in our country a very ambitious targets to realize a 49% CO2 reduction in the year 2030. This will even increase to 55% giving the Green Deal from, from the European Commission. And then the question is, how are we going to do that? And so we have made an agreement with a lot of different sectors and we also see a lot of solutions like uh, electrification, uh, more wind, more solar energy, but there is also an important role for biomass. And we see, especially in the Netherlands, this role, not so much for the production of electrons, electrons, but more for the production of fuels, specifically aviation fuels and marine fuels, but also for biochemicals. So how to produce materials and chemicals from biomass. This all requires sustainable production uh, of biomass. And for that reason, we have uh, let in the Netherlands formulated a so-called integrated framework on sustainability. So not just for biofuels, but for all uses of biomass in our country. And uh, that will now be leading for the next, uh, next time. And at the same time, we also try to promote the bioeconomy. And uh, so this, uh, through this, let's say, um, uh, <clears throat> policy uh, debate that we will have here and we will listen to a lot of different opportunities. We will also hear hurdles and I hope that we can have an open discussion uh, with the audience uh, but also between the panelists on how this can be achieved because we have a lot of different examples from Brazil, from the US, from Europe and also an overview will be given uh, by the IEA. And um, so all, uh, let's say, uh, participants uh, here in this, uh, uh, in this webinar are invited to join us in through the Q&A on, uh, on WUFA, on the WUFA platform. You can have, you can fill in your questions and answers will then be given to you. Um, what is, uh, so that's, uh, and then later on, we will come back to these questions. So you are, you're most welcome to come to, come to us with your, with your questions. Okay, so after this uh, introduction, and uh, I would like uh, to give the floor to the first speaker, and uh, who will give us an, an overview of what's going on. Uh, it is uh, Paolo Frankel, who is the head of the Renewable Energy Division at the International Energy Agency. Um, he has joined that already since 2007, and since a few years, the IEA is also the facilitator of the BioFuture platform. So it's a very nice combination uh, to hear you speaking on, let's say, the, the different policies and how they can enable the bioeconomy in the, in the, in the world. 
Thank you very much, Case, for this kind introduction. I would like to ask the organizers to put my slides on, if possible. Perfect. So, indeed, it is a pleasure for me today to share with you some uh, methodological aspects and preliminary results of the work on the policy blueprint, which is an exercise precisely to assess the effectiveness of the policies on bioenergy in different countries. Next, please. Before I do that, please remind, allow me to repeat the message that I always give uh, at the risk of being repetitive. Uh, bioenergy is really the overlooked giant of renewables. We tend to uh, speak so much about solar and wind. We should never forget that bioenergy is 50% of total modern bioenergy, is 50% of total renewable energy consumption in the world. And what is more important, uh, according to our sustainable development scenarios for a sustainable future, this gigantic role needs to become even more gigantic in the future. And to give an example that you can see here, uh, liquid biofuels should triple, more than triple in the next uh, decades. Uh, biogas should uh, um, grow by a factor four. And deliberately, I have uh, put uh, these uh, graphs in relation with low carbon hydrogen, um, for which there is a big uh, momentum, uh, for two reasons. Uh, one is to compare the amounts that uh, are actually larger, at least for these two decades, for uh, bioenergy, biofuels, and biogases. But the second also because, in perspective, the combined advancement of biotechnologies and low carbon hydrogen opens the door for the bioeconomy, in particular for producing biochemicals. Next, please. Now, the first question in the, which is driving this exercise on the assessment of policies, are we on track? And if you look at this graph, and these are biofuels uh, transport data globally, historic data, our forecast until 2025, and then the 2030 targets in both scenarios. But what really matters is the sustainable development scenario. Well, you can easily see uh, biofuels are growing, but not fast enough. More, uh, moreover, they were severely hit by the crisis in 2020 with a minus 12 uh, production drop, the first stop after two uh, decades of growth. And therefore, obviously, there is an urgent policy action, A, to trigger a rebound, and B, to accelerate the deployment needed to be on track with the SDS. So let's go, next slide, please. Um, let's go to the objectives of the policy blueprint exercise. Next, please. Excellent. So uh, this is a methodology uh, that is uh, used, the aim of which is a critical review of a country bioenergy policies in order to do three things. One, to assess the progress in developing bioenergy in the overall country context. Two, identify and share best practice of policy principle, uh, principles and examples. And three, identify also weak spots and help country to identify additional area for policy action, be it domestic or regarding international policy collaborations. Next, please. We are currently in a pilot phase. Uh, next slide, I don't see it yet. Uh, to test and the refine, it's okay. To the keep keep this one um, to test and refine the methodology. Um, it has a focus on biofuels for transport, but with the aim in the future to expand it to other sectors. Uh, we are looking at detailed analysis of policies in five countries, and at the right moment, there is analysis underway for the United States, uh, Brazil, and the Netherlands. Now, these results are still too preliminary, so I will not show any result with a country name, but I will try to give you the idea of where the analysis is going and what kind of usefulness it can have. So the process is to do country profiles that, first of all, have a country characterization. Each country is different. 
in terms of maturity of markets, in terms of uh, access to technologies and options and also end users. Um, uh, think, for instance, about the possibility of having fuel flex uh, cars, just to give an example. The second point is a detailed description of the policies that are applied, that are of different type. And then the third, uh, the part in, on the analysis has two main outputs. The deployment indicators that show how quickly bioenergy is evolving. And the other part is the evaluation of a portfolio of policies. Next, please. So <clears throat> for the indicators, we're looking at four main um, metrics. One is the bioenergy contribution to final energy consumption uh, in uh, uh, percentage. Second, the share of bioenergy to transport final energy consumption, since we are focused on this part. Third, the question, are we on track or not to meet the, first of all, the own country targets, and second, uh, the IEA SDS benchmark levels. And last but certainly not least, what are the associated um, net greenhouse gas uh, savings uh, over the life cycle, which because what really matters in the end is also to have a real environmental um, benefit. So next slide. As I said, you will not find any names of countries. The first point is to have an assessment of the example of the deployment uh, trends. This is country X, where we see the development in the, in the left, the historical data, and then they compare on the right with the national target and we, with the IEA SDS level, because these are two distinct uh, questions. The first is, of course, to see whether the deployment is in line with the targets, which is obviously the first step. The second is for us to ask the question, is the target ambitious enough to contribute to a sustainable development uh, mix? In this case, the performance is pretty good. Of course, this is a very simple in linear interpolation. You could uh, imagine other type of interpolation like an exponential curve, but more or less here, this is an example where we would say the uh, analysis, the development is pretty on track. And then the next slide is important because it shows the six criteria for assessing the policies. First of all is the strategic priority. What importance is given to buy energy in the energy planning uh, of the country? Case mentioned the strategic plan of the Netherlands just uh, a few minutes ago and second, uh, how does this compare with the our scenarios for 2025 and 2030? Second, a crucial point, policy, certainty, and clarity. Is there a secure long-term basis to promote deployment and investment and our policies and instrument? Is there a long-term visibility for the businesses to do their business plan? Third, what is the market access? Maybe the production is there, but there is no access to demand. Third, fourth, the financial support. Uh, in several cases, uh, maybe there is a cost gap with traditional uh, fossil fuels. Are there incentives enough that make investment in biofuels production and use viable? Fifth, uh, all this needs to be sustainable. And what is the kind of sustainable governance? A measure in place with ensure that the biofuels meet the sustainability, both the supply and the use meet the sustainability requirements. And sixth, last but certainly not least, the relation with innovation. Is there support for development and commercializations of new fuels and processes? And how, and the fifth and the, the sixth are uh, interlinked, how do we make sure, for instance, that there is continuous innovation and continuous environmental improvement? Next, please. So just an example of how the results can be visualized in spider graphs where you can immediately see what policy practices these are invented. And as I said, we cannot show the names of the countries for the moment. Obviously, 
all this when the when there will be names of the countries will be reviewed and will be approved uh, by the countries himself the point here is not to uh, say which country is good and which is bad but rather how to learn uh, from each other next slide and one important so this is another possible visualization and a complementary where we use uh, uh, green uh, yellow red uh, traffic lamp uh, lights to highlight two things one the green are good policy practices that can be possibly shared and exchanged with other countries and applied while yellow and red um, indicate some weaker points in the national policies and that should be the focus of attention of policymakers in the near future next please uh, finally, there has to be the recognition that there are no one-fits-all solutions and there are different policy pathways where you can get to the same or at least a similar effectiveness in results. Uh, here uh, we can see, and as you very well know, there are different market access rules and financial support rules for Brazil and US, the two largest uh, producers in the world of uh, biofuels, and then for the Netherlands, I mean, this, uh, all these parts will be compared and there will be a judgment and an assessment of to what extent they can be uh, used um, uh, in order to have effective and positive deployment of uh, biofuels and in the future of uh, bioenergy more in general. My last uh, concluding remark is to summarize, one, that biofuels are an essential part of the future sustainable transport energy mix, and there has to be much more policy attention on them. Uh, the biofuel use has been growing, but definitely too slowly to meet long-term sustainable needs. And current policy frameworks worldwide, not in specific countries, but globally, are not sufficiently ambitious. Uh, the Biofuture Platform Policy Blueprint will provide a critical review of policies providing good practice examples but at the same time also emphasize highlighting um, some weaker parts which can uh, identify scope for further domestic uh, policy action uh, once again here the, the the point is not to say who is good and bad but rather to improve altogether uh, fifth four four points excuse me um, highlighting that you can have different approaches to tackle key barriers and have similar results in in terms of effectiveness of deployment and effectiveness of policies it is to be the fact that policies need to be adapted to specific country context and i repeat there are no silver bullets there are no uh, one fits all solutions and uh, we look forward to applying the approaches to policies in a wider range of countries of the platform first to refine the approach and then draw out uh, principal policy lessons but some of them are already there in terms in particular of the six criteria that needs to be assessed and it is really a multi criteria analysis type of which which makes the overall context of a policy effective or not. I thank you very much for your attention and welcome any questions, if any. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Paolo, for this uh, introduction to the policy blueprint. Um, this is will give very interesting information. It is a work in progress. Uh, I could imagine that there are uh, questions and uh, I kindly invite everyone who has a question to put them in the Q&A of the VUVA. So later on, we will come back to these questions and we will try to, to answer them. So thank you very much for this, uh, for this overview of the policy blueprint. Um, and this uh, leads us also to the next speaker who will um, speak to us, let's say, about the Renova bio system in Brazil. It is uh, Daniele Silva Conde, uh, who graduated in law for, at the Rio de Janeiro, the university there. Uh, she has been working at the Brazilian regulatory agency 
and uh, she is now at this moment also the superintendent uh, intendant uh, deputy role uh, where she is lo also looking after Renova Bio. So it was already mentioned, we are looking at uh, biomass policy. So I think uh, Brazil has a very interesting, uh, let's say, example for us. So the, the floor is yours to explain how it works in your country. Thank you, King. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'd like to greet all my panel mates. And uh, on behalf of ANP, to thank uh, Renato Godinho and the organizer of the second Biofuture Summit for inviting me to participate in this important event. Uh, it's an honor for me to be here and share our experience in implementing our new biofuel policy called RenovaBio. Next, please. And uh, regard, regarding the, the theme of this panel, uh, RenovaBio uh, is a policy that uh, encourages actions aiming uh, reducing carbon and uh, it was instituted at the end of 2017 with uh, this, this object of uh, reducing carbon intensity in our Brazilian transportation matrix. Uh, to achieve this goal, uh, it was defined that uh, it would be necessary to encourage biofuel production and usage and uh, stimulate more biofuels diversity and competitiveness. Three important tools were created to achieve uh, the policy's objectives. Are they decarbonization targets, decarbonization credits, and the certificate of efficient biofuel production? Next, please. The national decarbonization target is defined uh, by the Brazilian Energy Policy Council every year for a 10 year scenario, bringing predictability and security to the agents involve, involved and investors. After that, ANP calculates distributors' targets to acquire CBUs based on the, their annual target set by 10P and the fossil fuel market share in, this, in the previous year. Here in Brazil, the obligated part to prove uh, decarbonization is the distributors. According to the defined goals, Brazil intends to reduce its carbon intensity in transportation fuels by 10% by 2030. Uh, next, please. Uh, according to the, the final goals, Brazil intends, uh, sorry, the certification process um, aims to recognize and compensate the exact con contribution of uh, each biofuel in reducing carbon intensity. It's done individually by plants and uses the life cycle assessment methodology. Uh, it's conducted by uh, an accredited firms, and uh, it uses uh, life cycles um, uh, assessment. And uh, and at the end, we have the environmental energy efficiency rate and the CBUs generation factor. Uh, it's it's important to mention here that uh, the process always also assess uh, the origin of biomass uh, because uh, if uh, if it's confirmed that uh, uh, it's from uh, deforestation area it's not accepted next please uh, a CBU is equivalent to a ton of co2 avoided and it's considered an environmental asset uh, CBUs can only be generated by certified biofuel producers or importers, which are uh, offset by the exact contribution to reducing carbon intensity. The amount of CBUs generated is the result of the amount of biofuel sold by the plant and its environmental energy efficiency. The asset is placed by underwriter for sale over the counter on the B3 exchange. Next, please. 
so far, we already have 57% uh, of biofuels producers certified under the Renova BU, uh, being uh, 213 of uh, ethanol, 22 of biodiesel, and one of biomethan. Next, please. These plants uh, have already generated a total of of uh, 16 million CBUs, and uh, it's an amount that exceeds the volume necessary to reach the national goal established for this year. Next, please. The negotiations of the assets shows that 60% uh, of CBUs needed to achieve the year target are already in the hands of, of the distributors. This is a good point, too. Next, please. With an average price of 44 uh, reais. Analyzing the strengths aspects uh, of our policy, we can highlight the following points. We have a robust legal and regulatory framework because uh, since uh, 2017, we have a law. And after that, we had a decree and regulation that uh, from ANP and CNP that regulated all the, the procedures to, to, to the policy. We also have a predictability of the carbonization targets because they are defined for a 10 year scenario and all the rules um, on the table since uh, uh, 2018. We also have transparency at all stages all the process of setting and monitoring targets and the certification process, they are uh, all uh, transparent. Uh, the policy recognizes and compensates the exact contribution of each plant to meet the decarbonization target and stimulates the preservation of native forests and vegetation. Because the biomass produced at deforestation areas, as I said, is not accepted in the policy to generate CBUs. Uh, the policy does not use uh, government subsidies to make biofuel more competitive and encourage greater investments in new technology and improvements in environmental energy efficiency. Next, please. Uh, despite the various strengths, uh, we cannot ignore that we have some challenges ahead such as we have to increase the volume of biofuels in the program. Uh, and we have uh, some difficulty in grain chain. And uh, we also need uh, new units to, to achieve uh, the volume necessary to the next year's uh, CBUs goals. Um, we need to encourage new feedstocks and process that uses co-products and residues uh, to, to, because uh, they are uh, lower in carbon intensity and uh, it will contribute a lot with uh, our target. Uh, we have to introduce, to, to, to study, analyze and uh, cover uh, a way to introduce more advanced biofuels here in Brazil in our transportation matrix. Because, uh, as we can see at this moment, only CBU is not being sufficient to, to apparently to um, stimulate this kind of biofuel here. Uh, another challenge is the lawsuits questioning uh, aspects of the policy that we started to see. The first one uh, at, the, at the beginning of this month. And uh, another aspect is the consideration of look in the certification process. We have to develop uh, uh, a methodology to, to introduce this look in our calculation of uh, GAG emission. Next, please. So at the end, we expect uh, that Hanover B will have helped Brazil to meeting 
the target set that copy 21 and 22, uh, reducing our carbon intensity, guarantee the national supply of fuels, expand biofuel production and supply with regulatory predictability, and increase the energy efficiency, and uh, uh, stimulate generating jobs, income, and regional development related to sustainable economy. That's it. Thank you. Thank you very much for your introduction and your description, but also the results that you have achieved now with uh, the Renova Bio uh, program. I think it's very, very challenging. It's uh, you have started this, uh, it has taken off. And at the same moment, of course, there are also still some issues that you're working on. But this is really a very good example on how to develop a new uh, policy stimulating uh, <coughs> carbon efficient use uh, pro of production of energies. Uh, I have some questions to you, but I will postpone them. I also see that questions are coming in in the Q&A, so people are getting active with questions. I first want to do uh, a few more presentations, and then we will go in the Q&A sessions, we will go through these questions that have been uh, posed here in the, in the Q&A. So <coughs> this leads us now from uh, Brazil to the next presentation. It is uh, Stephanie Batchelor uh, from um, BIO, that's the Biotechnology Innovation uh, Organization in the USA. And she is very active in, let's say, describing the policies, but also assessing the policies in the United States of America and how that can stimulate, let's say, low carbon fuels. And she is also active through the Below 50, uh, let's say, initiative that has been set up. So uh, very much welcome you. And uh, yes, and maybe and you are also the chair of the women in, in the industrial biotechnology group. Yeah, so I welcome you for this, uh, for your presentation on what's going happening in the USA. Thank you, Keys, Renato, and the Biofuture Summit organizers uh, and my fellow panelists. It's a pleasure to be with you today. I'm Stephanie Batchelor. I'm the Vice President of the Industrial and Environmental Group at the Biotechnology Innovation Organization. Uh, for those who are not familiar with BIO, we're the world's largest biotech trade association, representing 1,000 members across the biotech ecosystem that are working to apply biotechnology in the energy, ag, manufacturing, and health sectors to improve the lives of people and animals and the health of the planet. We're working on behalf of our members to make headway with lawmakers to create a more resilient economy. And we believe biotechnology will be key to that resiliency. Thank you for pulling up the slides. Can we go to the next one? So we know that air pollution from the burning of fossil fuels has a profoundly negative effect on public health. Uh, shortly after the first wave of the coronavirus tore through the United States, Harvard University's T.H. Chan School of Public Health found that those who live in areas with increased air pollution and particulate matter in the air, such as from transportation, are more likely to die from COVID-19. Here in the US, the transportation sector is the largest emitter of greenhouse gases. So this makes the enormous task of addressing climate change all the more important, especially as we look to build back a greener, more resilient transportation sector and economy. Our members have the solutions to decarbonize the transportation sector, and we're looking forward to working with the new Congress and administration to do so. Uh, next slide. So with Vice President Biden's victory, the US will take a more aggressive approach to addressing climate change and to reducing greenhouse gas emissions. However, the incoming administration's options will be limited with the Democrats having a much smaller majority in the House of Representatives and the Republicans projected to maintain control in the Senate. We've been actively engaged with the Biden campaign and his transition team to identify opportunities to grow the market for sustainable fuels and to find bipartisan solutions that can be advanced in a divided Congress. So to start, the incoming administration can take immediate action to bring some certainty and stability to the renewable fuel standard. Uh, can we go to the next slide? Just as a little background, the U.S. Renewable Fuel Standard was updated in 2007, requiring obligated parties to sell a certain amount of renewable fuel per year. Conventional biofuels are essentially capped at 15 billion gallons per year, 
with the total standard including requirements for 36 billion gallons per year by 2022. However, over the last several years, the RFS has been under attack basically from every angle, lawsuits from oil companies, waiver requests, and bills introduced on the Hill to waive the volumes. We'll be advocating closely with the Biden administration to stop the issuance of small refinery exemptions to unqualified refineries, to direct agencies to advance stalled pathways and facility registrations for advanced and cellulosic biofuel technologies, and to direct agencies to purchase sustainable fuels in both ground and air transportation. Legislatively, we've worked to develop a number of bipartisan bicameral bills that can spur the development, deployment, and consumption of sustainable fuels. Last summer, we worked with Rep uh, Republican Senator John Thune and uh, Democratic Senator Jean Shaheen to introduce legislation that would approve advanced biofuel registrations that have languished at our Environmental Protection Agency, despite the fuels being used in the states. The bill also sets a time frame requirement for EPA to respond to applications moving forward. Democratic representatives in our House have recently introduced a House version of this bill. Legislation like this could help to bring both sides together in the next Congress in advancing bipartisan solutions to address emissions in the transport sector. Uh, next slide. So as I think we know, aviation accounts for 2.5% of global greenhouse gas emissions and is expected to triple by 2050. Sustainable aviation fuels can reduce airline emissions now and help the economy too. Derived from renewable biomass or waste byproducts, SAF has been shown to reduce the carbon footprint of aviation fuel by up to 80% over their full life cycle. Representative Julia Brownlee of California recently introduced the Sustainable Aviation Fuel Act. This is legislation to incentivize the production of sustainable aviation fuel and to help the aviation sector to reduce carbon emissions. It would create a new blender's tax credit for SAF, which would be linked to carbon reductions. It would also authorize $1 billion in federal funding for U.S. projects that produce, transport, blend, or store SAF. And it would authorize the $175 million in research funding to push the limits of existing SAF technology. It would require the EPA to establish an aviation-only low-carbon fuel standard that would be similar to California's successful transportation-wide LCFS. So this bill is a first step, and Representative Brownlee's office is seeking feedback on this legislation to improve the bill, but it's great to see SAF to get attention in Congress as a solution to addressing greenhouse gas emissions. Next slide. Had Democrats taken control of Congress in our recent uh, elections uh, just this month, a large climate change package would have been on the table. But the prospects of this now are much lower, especially if Republicans maintain control of our Senate. One part of a climate bill would be the development of a nationwide low carbon fuel standard, which establishes a life cycle assessment of the carbon content for each fuel used in the LCFS. We have been working with policymakers and stakeholders um, at BIO to seek the appropriate federal role for supporting a nationwide LCFS. Importantly, for the policy to be effective, it must be technology and feedstock neutral. Again, a legislative path appears challenging at this point. One possibility is for the incoming administration to take action on developing an LCFS under the existing RFS regulations. So while the RFS statute sets volumes through 2022, as I mentioned earlier, it does not expire. The program doesn't expire in 2022. After that year, the EPA will take over with the authority to set RFS volumes at their own discretion beginning in 2023. At the same time, the EPA is required by law to update its biofuels targets for 2020 to 2022 due to the reset that was triggered at the end of 2018. If you have questions on this, please ask later. Um, so at that time, the volumes required for advanced cellulosic and total renewable fuels fell short of their statutory levels by at least 20%, and that's what triggered the reset. So key policymakers advising the Biden transition have suggested that the Clean Air Act, which the RFS falls under, 
presents a potential pathway to develop a low carbon fuel standard. An LCFS policy can be a way to bridge the divide between rural America and urban America, between biofuels and electric vehicles. So this policy could create the coalition that is needed to fight the constant attacks and misinformation put out by big oil. And the private sector seems to be outpacing policy, as we've seen companies like Alaska Airlines, General Motors, and even manufacturers like IKEA urge lawmakers across states to pass low carbon fuel standards. We understand this is not an easy task, but we know the benefits of enacting low carbon fuels policy and the gains that can be realized for society. We are committed to creating a policy which builds upon the RFS. We believe there are several ways to do this, such as requiring the RFS volumes to be maintained or incorporating the RFS volumes into the initial baseline carbon intensity as Oregon did. Next slide. Even with the uncertainty in Washington, DC, we continue to promote the low carbon fuel standard at the state level, along with our allies in the low carbon fuels coalition. We have seen several states take action to decarbonize transportation and to reduce emissions. California and Oregon, uh, as I think were mentioned earlier, both have policies. In California, 62 million tons of carbon pollution have been avoided since the state's low carbon fuel standard was implemented in 2011. And that is equal to more than 13.4 million passenger vehicles taken off the road. So we can see that California's model for decarbonizing transportation is working. Washington State and New York are actively pursuing uh, legislation. They were pursuing it in 2020 until coronavirus derailed those discussions. We anticipate that to pick back up again in 2021 in those two states. Both Minnesota and Iowa are having preliminary discussions. Bio's been active in all those states, participating in a leadership role in Clean Fuels New York, as well as with the Washington Business Coalition to connect with state coalitions and lawmakers. Next slide. Creating a more resilient world starts by reducing greenhouse gas emissions and cleaning up our planet. We know that low carbon fuel standards are proven drivers in decarbonizing the transportation sector. We expect efforts to ramp up early in 2021 around low carbon fuel policy in general. Uh, Bio plans to be there leading advocacy efforts as we work to reduce emissions in transportation. But emissions from sustainable fuels are only a part of the problem. We must also focus on greening our supply chains. I should say emissions from transportation fuels. In order to focus on greening our supply chains, we need to advance renewable chemical development and bio-based manufacturing to address climate change and public health and grow the bioeconomy. You can stay up to date on the latest by subscribing to our Good Day Bio newsletter, by following bio on social media, or by reading my bi-monthly column in the Industrial Biotech Journal, where I touch on the latest policy updates for sustainable fuels, biobased manufacturing, and the bioeconomy at large. Again, happy to be here with you and look forward to taking questions. Keys, back to you. Thank you very much. Yes, so it's uh, good to hear some, <clears throat> let's say, good messages from the USA after we were all uh, disturbed with uh, very confusing elections that happened uh, in your in your part of the world recently. Um, so there are, of course, questions to you. Uh, please, uh, audience, send them in in the, in the Q&A. Uh, we will collect them all and come back to you later on in the Q&A uh, session, um, where we can also have a look, let's say, on what is happening in, in the USA and also how the LCFS, how that can go and also be implemented in other countries. But before going there, we will go to two other continents, and that's, uh, first of all, Europe, where uh, Zoltan Zabo, who is an environmental uh, economist, uh, is also a sustainability consultant to the bioeconomy uh, industries and specifically for ethanol Europe. Uh, so he has a lot of experience on, on let's say, developing uh, business and uh, in a sustainable way with industries here in Europe. And he is going to tell us the developments that he sees uh, from his point of view going on in Europe. So the floor is yours, uh, Sultan. Thank you very much. Can I have the slides, please? Yeah. For those of you, for those who don't know, um, let me introduce Ethno Europe. Uh, next slide, please. 
So at Ethanol Europe, through its sister company, owns uh, the largest conventional ethanol plant in Europe and is also an active investor in advanced biofuels. This year, commissioning a new cellulosic uh, biogas plant. Next slide, please. Uh, let me start off with a, with a statement. I think um, the transport decarbonization policy of the European Union has failed. Uh, and it, it is failing again. Uh, so there was a so-called renewable energy directive, which is uh, which is just to be uh, uh, implemented in Europe. And uh, uh, as you can see, um, it didn't make uh, much progress. In fact, transport is the only sector uh, in Europe where the greenhouse gas emissions are on the rise. Uh, you can see on the chart that uh, most sectors are making progress, but transport uh, uh, in Europe is not. And uh, today the emissions uh, are in fact uh, higher than uh, say 10 years ago. So um, the follow-up directive, the so-called Renewable Energy Directive 2 uh, is already under revision before it has or before it has entered into place, into force. So uh, um, obviously this is not a stability. It's, there is no political uh, policy stability in the European Union, which is uh, not good for, for investors. Uh, investment, uh, just as a follow-up, uh, uh, ceased to, to materialize in the, in the past decade. And the chances are that by the time the RED2 enters into force, there will be a limited number of years to actually incentivize further investments in renewable energy technologies in transport. And so uh, the policy framework will fail again. And as a result, you can see on the chart, oil consumption uh, has been increasing over the past uh, couple of years in the European Union. Next slide, please. Uh, in the European Union, there is a policy disconnect around the crop-based biofuels, and uh, and uh, there has been a number of uh, uh, discussions going on. And uh, two major elements I would like to focus on just briefly, and it's the food versus fuel discussion and the ILOC. So it has been predicted that uh, uh, biofuel consumption. Uh, Will, will lead to food price increases, but uh, these early predictions have never came true. In fact, as you can see on the chart, uh, uh, crop prices are at historical low, uh, if, you, if you look at the 100 year old uh, trend. Uh, and obviously, and, and, and uh, one, one could argue that uh, farming even needs more markets more outlets because uh, at least in the european union uh, farm farmlands are being abandoned so and the, and the profitability of farming is quite low so additional markets uh, are needed for for the for the farmers and uh, all the while um, the european commission uh, uh, claimed that the public uh, demanded curbs on, on biofuels uh, but uh, in fact, the opinion polls show an overwhelming support for crop-based biofuels. So science is clear. Uh, latest science finds that there, there, there has been no evidence of food price increases uh, or other lands converted to agriculture because of, of biofuels. Um, so uh, next slide, please. And also, you need to keep in mind that the industry is also changing. So, for instance, the conventional uh, ethanol industry, the climate profile of the conventional ethanol industry is keep, keep improving. Uh, today, it, uh, it delivers a 72-point uh, uh, reduction in greenhouse gas emissions compared to petrol. And uh, I look is, is also found to be low. Next slide, please. 
so at the same time that the industry keeps improving and the science is getting clear that the negative impacts uh, are minimal or non-existent or at least manageable, uh, the global picture is different. Uh, uh, conventional biofuels, and if you're talking about with the global picture, it's mainly ethanol. So ethanol has become the third uh, scalable new renewable uh, this century, along with solar and wind. And uh, uh, of course, um, due to the low prices of ethanol, which is often uh, lower than oil, which is quite a feat because there is one problem with oil, is that it is cheap. Uh, so all this makes it uh, an economic powerhouse. So the ethanol industry is an industry which, which is quite strong and, and robust uh, in, in many respects. And, and since the, the, the price is quite competitive, then uh, ethanol is one of the lowest cost carbon abatement measures today in, in transport. I could refer to the uh, jobs uh, aspect as well. Fatih Birol in the opening uh, speech already discussed it. Um, I think, I think it's, a, it's a lot more difficult to create and maintain jobs in rural environments. It is relatively easy to create jobs in urban settings. And that is what, uh, what an ethanol industry brings, uh, jobs in rural environments. Next slide, please. Uh, one would hope that uh, sooner or later these facts, scientific and uh, facts and data, uh, is is uh, 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 appreciated in the European Union, and there are some in instances. Uh, there are so-called progress reports, and uh, one of those progress reports, the latest one called the Renewable Energy Progress Report, finds that uh, uh, there has been no correlation between food price increases and biofuel dem demand in the in the European Union, and uh, most member states did not observe any impacts on prices due to increased bioenergy demand. And uh, of course, if, if there is no price impact, then I look indirect land use change can also not happen. Uh, so, uh, uh, and, and, and the jobs are, the jobs aspects are also important. So the uh, third largest renewable energy job creator after wind energy and solid biomass are the biofuel industry. And, uh, but uh, sooner, once, once these facts are presented, uh, the European uh, Union document uh, goes back to its, its uh, usual evidence and science-free policy conclusion and uh, actually uh, suggests that the use of uh, uh, so-called food and crop-based biofuels uh, are replaced by advanced biofuels. Next slide, please. So there is uh, an ideology in, in the European Union in certain uh, circles in, in Brussels, and uh, that results in uh, virtual progress. There is a, an increasing gap between reported and actual progress in in terms of renewable energy uptake in the transport sector in the European Union. And uh, there is a, a so-called double counting or multiple counting uh, mechanism applied in the European Union. And it means that you take one unit of renewable energy and you count it twice or four times more in the case of renewable electricity. And of course, this is just a virtual progress and, uh, and the the gap between the virtual and actual progress what is it of course it's it's the usual uh, fuel used in transport which is oil so uh, the reported progress is is uh, uh, is not bad but the actual progress is is this small in the, has been this small in the european union sweden is perhaps the only country where real progress has been made significant uh, level. Next slide, please. So it can only happen in the European Union that uh, uh, a 10% target uh, is, is met by virtual progress. 
And you can see on the chart that the green bars show the actual renewable energy used in transport. And uh, the virtual progress, the reported progress, it shows an increase. And the gap between the two, the black uh, area, is nothing else but oil. So it can only happen in the European Union. And uh, most of the growth, as you can see, in renewables, in so-called renewables, in transport, uh, this decade is actually oil. And please keep in mind that uh, that these uh, cover the whole sector. So renewable ele electricity, conventional biofuels, advanced biofuels, biogas, even other renewables are included. All would need to replace, displace oil, but uh, it happens virtually. And, and a case in point is, is the Netherlands. So um, you can see on the chart that uh, in 2018, the latest year for which data is available, the virtual progress is almost as, as, much, as high as the actual progress uh, in the in the Europe in in, in Netherlands, so um, uh, calling oil derived energy a renewable uh, is something of particularity in in the European Union. Next slide, please. So, uh, what are what about the ambitious and what about the progress uh, towards twenty thirty? You can see that uh, the red line shows the business as usual. The right, uh, the the yellow line shows what the European Union is actually offering in terms of decarbonizing transport. And the difference between the two is the oil displaced. Displaced. Uh, it's not much. It's not much. So oil remains king, and uh, I think there is there is a high chance that uh, unless there is another U-turn in policy making in the European Union, uh, the next decade will be uh, wasted just as the decade prior to 2020. And please don't get me wrong. I mean, I've got nothing against virtual things. This conference is, is a virtual one and it's effective, uh, but uh, the progress made in Europe is also virtual, but it's not effective. Thank you very much. Looking forward uh, to the discussion. Yes, hello, Sultan. Thank you very much for your presentation and uh, maybe for some provocative uh, words. So uh, yeah, well, <coughs> I think you made a good analysis. So thank you for that. Yes, indeed, uh, in the Netherlands, we use a lot of uh, double counting uh, uh, oils. So these are uh, oils from uh, waste materials uh, like used uh, cooking oils so that is uh, double counting and they are used for the uh, bio biofuel production so that indeed gives the results that you that you give and of course there are political reasons why that has been uh, why that has been done uh, i can explain that later on um but anyhow, thank you very much for your for your explanation, and it, it certainly will evoke questions. I see the questions already coming in, so um, this will now lead us to our final uh, presentation, uh, and we have with us uh, Sangita Kastur from India. Uh, she is a director at uh, the, the Department of uh, Biotechnology, DBT, at the Ministry of uh, Science and Education. And she will explain to us how India is going to introduce uh, biofuels and also the low carbon bioeconomy. The floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Keith, and thank you, uh, Renato, and the organizers of this uh, conference, Bio Summit. Um, it's very fortunate to uh, make presentation on behalf of India. Uh, as you all know, that uh, India is one of the largest, uh, largest, faster growing economies, and every there is demand growing from eight eight zero nine million metric. Uh, or equivalent to 19,968. So it's you know that this is the largest democracy. Next slide, please. And government of India has laid down an ambitious vision 
to bring secure affordable and sustainable clean energy for all citizens if you see in the uh, figure here india has at 2018 the energy requirement was 809 uh, uh, million tons of oil equivalent while it is going to be uh, double more than double in 2040 that is 1968 uh, uh, million tons of oil equivalent uh, there are lot of opportunities as well as challenges and if you see that renewable energy that part if you could see the red part so that share is going to rise from a 3.4% to 19.2% that is a very significant uh, uh, growth in the renewable energy sector we are going to look at that and uh, there are as i said there are lot of opportunities our government of india and prime ministry has said atmanirbhar bharat which is the self reliant india where we are also working towards uh, reducing the dependency there is a lot lot of efforts going on to reduce the uh, import because india is importing more than 80% crude oil to meet its energy demand next slide please yes uh, if we uh, look at the energy scenario towards the sustainability and decarbonization there are major four pillars that's like energy access and the efficiency energy sustainability and energy security and to reduce oil and gas import by 10% by 2020 the adopting biofuels and renewables which plays major role uh, which is also per can contribute to decarbonization of transport sector and their focus has been on uh, majorly on the domestic resources as we have we you all are know that there is agriculture based economy which india focus and lot of efforts are going to need to put in the rural sector and there is a lot of opportunity for as i said as many uh, speakers have said that employment generation in rural sector is very important and this bioenergy sector can good give good opportunity focus in this manner next slide please uh government initiative there have been lot of government initiatives and in incentivization uh if you say that ethanol blending program has been very effectively implemented uh we have 10% target by 2022 and 20% uh, blending of ethanol by 2030 whereas the for biodiesel the 5% blending is done in by 2030 uh and even now there there is a push for uh compressed biogas it is called bio cng which is going to be have taken major role by 2023 we all know that there are challenges of uh, uh, scattered and the seasonal availability of feedstock we know that the the, the whole the farmers whole stock or farmers are the uh, larger uh, uh, larger stakeholders but the holdings are smaller as compared to the other countries like us and others then commerciality of viability viability is very important the cost reduction is very important that's the major challenge here and the most important is the biomass sustainability which in netherland turkey has already spoken about that so how we can utilize this biomass a more sustainably sustainable way that focus has to be a long term focus should be uh, with not only with india but for all global countries we need to uh, look at this aspect uh, the uh, important uh, prime minister jeevan yojana which was launched in last year 2019 march which re reposes the ongoing ethanol and biodiesel program Uh, and also it emphasizes on decentralized biomass processing setting up second generation uh, bio refineries development of new feedstock development of new technologies and development of supply chain including collection centers biomass depot aggregators and improve viability through financial support so these are these are the major uh, uh, aspects and reforms are been considered by government of india and there are different constituent committees have constituted uh, which is also led by the ministers and interministerial groups and even state boards are taken into the board uh, for implementation of these policies next slide please as i said uh, this ethanol biofuel biofuel uh, bioethanol blending program is uh, aggressively implemented uh, in 2014 15 the share was 2.3% 
whereas currently now it is close to 8.5% and we are it is likely to uh, grow by uh, 20% to 2030 and in terms of volumes we can say that there is a uh, 670 crore liter million liters was the uh, uh, volume required for ethanol blending and which has gone up to 3350 million liters and which is expected to almost uh, uh, 13 13200 million liters by 2030 uh, currently the ethanol is coming from the vanji ethanol that is from molasses and later now because we know that considering the huge amount of and volume required for uh, meeting the blending target of 20 percent we need to have uh, ethanol coming from second generation uh, biofuels that is to ethanol which is uh, based on the uh, agriculture residues and those things technologies are available but however the challenges are uh, definitely for to bring down the cost and also the, in the initial investment and how to de-risk these uh, factors. So the government of India has taken major role and government, uh, there is two that's uh, PM Jeevan Yojana. Uh, government is uh, trying to give the viability gap funding support for setting up commercial plants, almost 12 commercial plants and 10 demonstration uh, plants where also the focus could be given for accelerated uh, research and development in order to uh, make this biofuel uh, 2G ethanol more cost effective. Uh, there are also, it's, it, the, from the second generation biofuel, it's going to add about 400 million liters of 2G ethanol. So which can contribute, we need a lot of ethanol. There are lots of uh, volumes that are required in order to meet the blending target, even 10% and 50%. So that would definitely contribute to decarbonizes the decarbonization of transport sector. Next slide, please. Uh, coming to the technology platforms for the 2G ethanol, there are uh, different technologies are available. As I said, oil marketing companies are the major stakeholder. They are going to uh, go with the one technology which utilizes the uh, bio uh, biomass with pretreatment and then delignification. Further, that lignin can be used for uh, development of value-added products. So lignin valorization is also a very important aspect and many technologies have come up and those are going to be scaled up. There is another platform which where these uh, from the cellulose, the sugar is produced and ethanol, whereas the pentose sugar also can be converted to different chemicals and valuable products. Then another technology which is very interesting, that is the gas fermentation technology. Uh, this is again one company is going to utilize this gas fermentation technology using the micro uh, engineered or wild microorganisms, the uh, carbon can be utilized to convert into ethanol. Uh, next slide, please. And now it's very important that, uh, as Keith has said, renewable chemicals and materials those play a very important role. Uh, you, using this biorefinery approach, uh, one can from the using the byproducts, many value-added chemicals and materials can be produced, which can uh, then bring back or uh, reduce the cost of the biofuel. In case of biodiesel, the again the uh, the uh, major concern has been the feedstock. So there is a limitation about feedstock because the te technology is very simple. That is the transesterification. However, the availability of feedstock is very important, and the demand is about nine. Uh, as I said, five percent blending uh, is the target by 2030, and we are unable to able make this target because the requirement is very huge. And so government has allowed now to use the waste cooking oil that is called uh, unused uh, used cooking oil, UCO, and the WCO, which is also a good source of biodiesel production. And the challenge is, again, the supply chain with stock. And because there are these organized, these, these organized sectors are there from hotel industry and many other places, uh, the collection and supply chain is very important aspect. And some countries and some cities are doing this good example. And uh, thou, uh, the, uh, this has been successful program. And the second thing is now coming to the second generation biodiesel using the algal platform. So we have, there are efforts going on in countries and the uh, biorefinery platforms using the algal biofuel biomass. After utilizing the, uh, taking out the lipid, the biomass can be utilized for many other purposes. And also many other commodities can be produced. So efforts are going on that huge facilities are coming up 
to demonstrate these algal biorefinery platforms. Other is due to UCO potential in India, vegetable oil consumption, and recently the standards have come. Government has banned use of uh, uh, used cooking oil if it contains more than 25% total polar compounds. So that oil would be definitely coming, and that would be useful for uh, biodiesel production. So in in summary, I can say that there is assured market for oil marketing companies. Uh, for both for biodiesel as well as bio bioethanol and hence this uh, through these policies our government of india is able to make uh, make the commitment and meet the uh, target of blending both ethanol as well as biodiesel next slide please uh, coming to the uh, satat this is one of the uh, big biggest initiative major initiative which was again announced in uh, 2018 october where this is uh, mostly it encourages the uh, production of CBGs that is compressed biogas using the waste like uh, uh, agriculture residues, then uh, municipal solid waste, and even the uh, cattle dung. Cattle dung. So those things uh, can be utilized, and those are available in plenty. More than 178 million metric tons of biomass is available. So these are multiple options available using the. Uh, uh, different biomasses and waste carbon can be utilized very valuably. Uh, there is opportunity for uh, again uh, from this uh, Satat policy, uh, 5,000 plants uh, could be set up by 2030, and the uh, marketing oil marketing companies have raised the expression of interest. And this can encourage uh, a lot of employment. Many entrepreneurs and decentralized mode. This policy can definitely use. And there are opportunities for rural employment for from this Satat scheme. And government of India is aggressively working on this, implementing of this Satat scheme. That is for uh, using this CBG compressed biogas, converting using it as a bio CNG in transportation sector. Next slide, please. Yeah, again, this, as uh, many speakers have said, the biofuel is the major, most, the most viable option for um, ATF and heavy industries. So, um, we are, India has demonstrated that using the biomass, so Jatropha, the first generation oil that was converted to the uh, aviation fuel and that has been successfully uh, floated in 2018, that has been demonstrated. And biojet will develop by one of the major uh, institutes under CSR, and even specification and standards are also being uh, developed here in India. So we are also looking forward to have more options. Uh, we are also using the systems and synthetic biology of advanced approaches and biotechnological tools in order to develop the different feedstock, advanced feedstock, uh, besides the uh, use of biomass and many other uh, biomass and waste options. Uh, the, the coming to the uh, again marine marine fuel is also the another option which can be explored for the biofuel so there is definitely market and opportunities for biobars and to grow the bioeconomy using the uh, and decarbonizing the um, transport sector next slide please uh, west energy again india has lot of because it's growing uh, economy and there is a demand for uh, even uh, uh, citizens power, uh, citizens uh, uh, capability for purchasing power has increased and there is a lot of waste generated per capita and thus there are a lot of waste generated and the garbage in order to reduce the uh, dumping at garbage side the principle it is always uh, advisable and recommended to have this uh, converting the municipal solid waste at the site and again this decentralized mode all these uh, principal waste to energy can be can have better options and land free or cost or the nominal uh, fee this link uh, these we are working with the corporations which are the urban local bodies which can play very important role in supply chain of these principal solid waste uh, the the major challenge here is again the segregation so that's currently india is facing this challenge of how organic waste can be segregated and those with uh, coming uh, new rules have come in 2016 where it source all these segregated uh, has to be disposed of and now the, with this implementation of these uh, solid waste management rules 
we hope that these uh, these technologies and coming of the biomethanation improved technologies all these waste energy plants would be would be more cost economic and will have a greater opportunity in uh, uh, down the line another 2 years and uh, we uh, there are different uh, demonstration plants india has set up to the uh, novel r&d uh, routes by increased bio both yields as well as the reducing the hrt so those technologies are available and those could be implemented in coming years next slide please Uh, in summary i would say that uh, the major focus of government of india is on biofuel and there is a lot of demand for transportation fuel for gasoline as well as diesel and we look forward to have lot opportunities in aviation as well as marine because there is a lot lot of coastal line india has got and uh, self reliant india and all these schemes also promote uh, local vendors and to invest in the uh, decentralized mode of waste energy then assistance in uh, de technology development and biofuel supply chain so these policies are also very uh, good and very effective and reforms in various areas to assist biofuel projects are definitely going to accelerate the uh, implementation of this blending program of, for both uh, bio bioethanol as well as biodiesel and thus can be to uh, reduce the uh, carbon emissions and decarbonize the transport sector the financial incentives to viability gap funding and the attractive prices for both uh, which which are also encouraging uh, for this implementation of apple policy uh, with this i would uh, stop here and i would be happy to take questions any and thank you once again to organizers and all my panels and moderator please thanks a lot Thank you very much, uh, Sangeeta, for your uh, presentation and uh, for this overview of what's happening in India. Uh, it's really uh, impressive and uh, we are looking for the next steps. It, it's very great to do this jointly also within uh, the, bio, <coughs> the Bio Future platform and see how we can develop the bio economy further. We had a lot of pres uh, presentations. Uh, it's now time for the Q&A. So we, we have got a lot of questions. So I would like to, to see all the... Um, let's say presenters on the screen and uh, everyone is there except uh, paulo franco who we do not see and actually i had my first question to him at least that's a question from the audience yes paulo you are there hello uh, because the audience has asked okay and um, when will this blueprint be released and also how can let's say uh, the science contribute to that analysis and um, Uh, so, so how will you come? How will you do the analysis on sustainability, and how can science contribute? Could you say some words on that? Thank you. Now, the exact uh, program and the dates will have to be decided by the BioFuture platform member countries as case studies evolve. I think the first step will be after the five first pilot phase is ready to have uh, an interim assessment of the robustness of the methodology and then um, decide uh, thereafter. Um, a milestone is, of course, the summit in May. So by that time, we should have some uh, advanced uh, situation and also uh, some results to be published. And then, obviously, the other big, big milestone is to have a tool that can contribute and inform COP26 in um, uh, later in the year okay. regarding regarding okay. Uh, your regarding your question on science uh, that's a good point uh, we can uh, we can do um, an external review process where these comments could be uh, welcomed and uh, be assessed now once again given the fact that it is a multi criteria analysis we cannot go into the super details of uh, how uh, any of these uh, criteria including sustainability are done or not uh, but definitely uh, having scientific input and the difference of opinions in the review will be helpful okay well that's this work in progress so it's excellent if people are uh, want to contribute to this um <clears throat> now the question i have a question actually to to the ladies so um to stephanie uh, daniele and and also to sangita you've introduced low carbon approaches in your country 
Um, what has been the success factor? Well, why could that work? Why, why? What was, in your view, the most important thing that made it happen? And also the hurdle. Yes. Yeah? So, so what, what was difficult to do? Because from these lessons, we can learn that to develop also low carbon policies in other countries. Maybe, Stephanie, if you could start. Sure. I mean, I think in a way the the success factor is also the the challenge. So, you know, we started in the U.S. with the bedrock policy for fuels, which is the renewable fuel standard back in 2007. And had that policy been implemented as intended, then I think, you know, it it was a clear market driver for fuels. The problem is that when you don't have stable, consistent policies, so when you have a policy that can be undermined by changing um, you know, political administrations, uh, the way in which the Environmental Protection Agency decides to weigh volumes or not weigh volumes, then, then you don't have a policy that, that is a true driver of low carbon fuels. Um, and then that you know, becomes a problem. So you know, when I think about successes, when you look at uh, the model that California has put forward with the low carbon fuel standard, it's a clear market driver. As long as it's, you know, feedstock and technology neutral, the feedstock and the technology is there. It is, it's ready for deployment. And the people in the country have shown a very clear preference for a lower carbon environment. They want cleaner air. They want healthier, more nutritious food. They want access to healthcare. Um, and you know, biotech can deliver that. We've seen biofuels and, and other low carbon fuels deliver that. But it's so important for new technologies to have a stable market signal. That's what's gonna bring in investors. That's what's gonna help to develop new technologies, technology, you know, fuels beyond ethanols and to advanced. Um, but it's just so important and necessary. So we've seen that in the US, I think extremely clearly. Um, you know, we've had success where there has been that clear market signal. And I think, you know, as we approach the, the new administration and some really key uh, climate policies that are being called for, you know, federally and at the state level that we're going to see some some real impactful change. So it's an exciting time for the bioeconomy. OK, thank you very much. Uh, it clearly slow, shows that, let's say, uh, public support, the public willingness to achieve a, a low carbon economy is, is very important, is very leading. But at the same moment, you also need a governance and especially a stable governance over many years to allow industry to do investments and, and to make it happening. Yeah, so it's uh, the government and governance is an important uh, item, stimulating, but uh, could also be a hurdle. That's what I learned from this. So, so in Brazil, Daniela, what, what do you think was the most important success factor to make it happen in, in, in Brazil? So uh, I think uh, we had uh, a, a lot of uh, factors that contribute with this because uh, we are a country that has a traditional uh, history in biofuels and uh, a large production of these products. Uh, and uh, uh, I think uh, the 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 inspiration of uh, LCFS helped us to, to build a particularly uh, model because uh, it's an inspiration, it's not uh, the, the copy of, uh, of their model, but uh, the, the individualization of the, 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 tar the, the grade of uh, its plant and uh, the idea of compensate uh, this exactly contribution I think it's a strong point, a strong aspect of our policy, and it's not uh, um, it's not uh, all the biofuels that will generate this credit. I think uh, this is another in, in important uh, uh, aspect of our policy that is uh, we we choose the criteria that uh, will give the the. We gave the the 
the the right of uh, of this producer to emit to issue the credits uh, and the deforestation criteria is I think it's very important uh, the 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 data the exactly data of uh, of uh, agriculture phase industrial phase and transportation uh, I think it uh, uh, gives to each uh, producer the the real uh, compensation that he that he deserves. So I think this is uh, uh, an interesting and important aspect of our policy. And uh, I agree with Stephanie that uh, the predictability is uh, an aspect that is very uh, important to, to to give the policy the stability necessary to the investors and to, to new units, to uh to new uh biofuels to be introduced on our to be introduced on our matrix so uh, i think uh, it's not easy to define uh, this target and exactly um the exactly biofuels and uh, their contribution that uh, we are going to have but i think this uh prediction is very important uh, and essential for for the policy. Okay, thank you, thank you very much. So it's uh, what what I hear. It has been difficult, yes, and uh, there <coughs> a lot. Of course, also the evaluation and calculations uh, are are difficult, but it gives you an, an an opportunity to to stimulate better biofuels. So so it also stimulates innovation, and you can even uh, let's say because it's a certificate, you can also add sustainability uh, to that. Yeah, so I think that's that's what I think it's very important to, to learn that. Sankita, do you have something to add to these uh, remarks on how you have uh, stimulated the low carbon uh, fuels uh, in? Uh, yes, I can add to that. So, and government of India has given the uh, good price for procurement. So that was a very good push for the uh, ethanol blending program. And the government definitely has pushed these all policies, reforms, whatever reforms are required. And putting together stakeholders, that very important role has taken by the government of India, which has played a significant role to push this implementation, an effective implementation of this and decarbonization of the uh, transport sector is contributing. The uh, other hurdles, basically the challenges still are there about the uh, availability of biomass and the uh, logistics supply chain and all those issues still those are need to be addressed uh, if you see the it's large country and diversity is there and continuous supply of same feedstock it's not there and we need to have robust technology for 2g ethanol such the challenges are there and second challenge is about the cost effectiveness as i said so we need to reduce the cost by both supply chain and but over linkages and this can contribute further so there are successes and there, but but policy has played major role in reaching this uh, biofuel and blending targets okay so so i thank think you. You, you, you you thank you very much you've shown a lot of let's say success factors of course also problems so so sultan uh, you were quite uh, let's say you saw problems in the in the eu policy so what do you what do you think could be an important lesson uh, for for Europe uh, when you listen to these uh, different examples? Yeah, thank you. So I think I think you, Europe should uh, look at uh, the developments in around the globe in all the other jurisdictions where where uh, biofuels, especially conventional ethanol, um, is considered as a sustainable uh, transport decarbonization technology. And I understand that the European Union uh, is after uh, palm oil because it comes with a high eye look impact. But at the same time, it should recognize that, that the baby shouldn't be thrown out with, with the bathwater. So those technologies that, that uh, are proven, scalable, and have delivered uh, should given a role. 
And uh, science is incre increasingly clear uh, uh, about the impacts. And uh, I think um, policies would need to be based on science. Actual data would need to be uh, studied, analyzed, and uh, our ideology should be put aside. Uh, perhaps it's time to another U-turn in the European Union in terms of uh, policy making. It wouldn't be the first and uh, hopefully it would be the last. Uh, otherwise, uh, the 2030 um, um, policy uh, will not will not deliver. Uh, and, and you can look at the um, example of India. It hasn't been mentioned, but for instance, E20 is already standardized in India and it's not standardized in, in the US or in the European Union. So 20% of uh, ethanol can be blended into petrol and uh, crucially, um, uh, the octane element of it is, uh, would need to be increased allowing for uh, uh, tapping into the so-called engine efficiency benefit because motor engines require uh, higher octane fuels. This is something that the automakers, car manufacturers uh, actually demand. So uh, there are initiatives ac across the planet. Maybe, maybe um, this should be uh, looked at and, and the European Union should pay attention to those developments that that actually rely on uh, rely more on uh, sustainable uh, biofuels. Okay, thank you very much. I think uh, this is an important uh, message uh, to work on. Um, so we have been talking about uh, biofuels, uh, the, the sustainability, also how to have let's say good market incentives uh, to introduce uh, it through policies into the market. Uh, there are a number of questions. I would now like to focus on the question of the biomaterials. Yes, we, we, when we talk about the bioeconomy, biofuels is one part, so that's what we discussed. That's where we see good, uh, good examples. But some of you have also mentioned that it goes broader. Yes, we're also looking at biomaterials. So, so what kind of policies could, uh, could, let's say, support biomaterials and how could we introduce that into our uh, let's say mixture of uh, of uh, materials and uh, so should that also be a kind of blending or should there be a kind of carbon tax or can it be done nationally or does it require a global approach uh, what are your ideas about let's say stimulating uh, the, the bioeconomy and uh, specifically the, the biomaterials who, who can i give the floor on on this topic sure. stephanie I can take that one yeah, so I mean, so bio-based manufacturing, the way that we think about it, uses biology, you convert ag and other renewable or waste feedstocks, and you create everyday consumer products. And those products reduce our dependence on petrochemicals, they grow the green economy, and really it's a new approach to manufacturing. So I think we've, we've all seen through COVID the necessity of greening our supply chains. Um, so this is something we've been thinking quite a lot about <laughs> at Bio, and uh, and I think in general um, in the U.S., et cetera. So to start with, the United States already has um, through our farm bill, we have a bio-based markets program where we have a bio-based label on all products um, that have a certain percentage of of biomass or, or a mass balance approach. Um, to, to biomass content. And we also have a federal procurement. So a necessary mandate to purchase bio-based products for the federal government. Now, again, back to stable policy that can be implemented as such, this procurement mechanism does not have, as it stands now, a, a, a force to implement. So a lot of the federal agencies just don't do it. But, but a simple um, driver such as that, federal procurement, um, global procurement, I mean, a lot of people say, well, we could just say, we'll just have a renewable standard, right? So that's one option, you know, X percentage has to be renewable. Um, just the way you have an LCFS. Well, of course, there's many challenges with that. Um, a lot of a lot of countries don't enjoy mandates. And um, in addition to that, 
renewable chemicals have individual life cycle assessment scoring. And so uh, that becomes a little more challenging. Um, I can tell you, since uh, we could probably have this conversation for quite a time, what we'll be speaking with the Biden administration about will be focusing on the federal agencies and their contractors to buy green, to buy bio-based, and to, to ensure that the federal procurement piece is happening. It's a huge market driver. Um, I also think we need to boost funding. So in our case, we have those bio-preferred programs through our um, Department of Agriculture. We'd like to direct funding there to help those programs. And then um, it's important to promote the development of manufacturing zones, of, of bio-based manufacturing zones. And that's gonna happen through direct aid to states and cities as part of likely some sort of uh, COVID recovery legislation. Um, you raised you know, the question of whether or not we can do this globally. I think if we're gonna seriously look at tackling packaging waste, um, you know, writ large, that global solutions and global harmonizations are, are gonna be enormously helpful there. That sort of draws you back to that um, mandate potential. But you know, at the end of the day, you, you, you also have to start having a conversation around um, how you price carbon and and what that looks like. So I think, you know, starting off country by country, state by state, at least having that procurement driver is a step in the right direction. Thank you very much for this suggestion. Are there others who have an idea about this? I see Sultan raising his hand. Please uh, go ahead. Thank you. So I, I would just like to uh, add on to what, what's been said. So the industry is changing. Um, it, it, you can no longer uh, talk about, uh, say, an ethanol industry, but it's biorefineries. And uh, just uh, the, the latest example of, of this transformation is, is the pandemic. Uh, when the pandemic required uh, an increased volume of hand sanitizers, uh, disinfectants, the, in the, the ethanol industry just like uh, uh, started to deliver it. So it's a flexible and innovative industry. And uh, what, what you will see in the next couple of years is, uh, is an increasing array of products coming online. So first you started with fuel, uh, feed has already long been produced. Uh, fiber also, uh, but biochemicals and bio-based product, products are are coming uh, coming. So bioplastics, and and you can also look at the the oil industry. So the pet petrochemical branch are increasingly important for them because uh, oil is replaced in transport by by biofuels and other uh, alternative fuels. So the petrochemicals. Uh, are there to be replaced by bio-based products, and I think I think the industry is is certainly moving that way, and this is one of the most innovative industries I've, I've ever come across with, and uh, I I expect that uh, by 2030, um, uh, actually the backbone of this transformation will be brought on by by uh, by the industry that that is today called uh, the ethanol industry. Okay, thank you. Um, any further addition from someone else on this question? Yes, Sankita? Yes, thank you, uh, Keith. Uh, so this is definitely, there is, as uh, my fellow colleagues have said, there is an industry market and we need to develop these renewable chemicals and materials market. Uh, there are a lot of opportunities and some uh, federal procurement process is there and some policies are there with replacement of like blending program for biofuel. Similarly, we should have a program for uh, chemicals, petrochemicals and fertilizers, and which is also going to uh, complement this biofuel, it also go grow the uh, another sector, it's biotech industry. So in, in India, we have a target of 100 billion biotech industry. So there is a lot of opportunity for biotechnology sector and which can contribute uh, significantly and uh, for the environment benefits as well as well. So, but we need to have focus much technology advancements are required, for example, in order to replace the uh, plastic with the bioplastics, we need to have those qualities which can uh, uh, definitely work for the uh, biodegradable plastics, uh, cost 
besides cost, the qualities of uh, strength and other issues are there. So those we need to address as quickly as possible. So scientists need to take this as a challenge and take accelerated innovations are required in this sector and with boost in policies also. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for, for your explanation. Indeed, it's uh, this is a very, uh, let's say, a new area. It's uh, challenging. So thank you very much for, for your suggestions. Also here in the Netherlands, we're looking forward for, let's say, a bio-based uh, procurement. And of course, also the development of production of bio-based chemicals and products. And that's a major thing that we have ahead of us. And it will, overall, it will reduce the utilization of fossil fuels. And through that, also so the uh, emission of carbon atoms. So that's that's an important uh, an, an important aspect. Um, there is a question now here. Well, it's a very personal question to uh, to uh, to Paulo Franco. Do you f believe that the European will meet the Europe uh, European Union will meet the emission reduction targets by two thousand and thirty? So so what do your scenarios show? Paolo, is that something you could answer? No, I don't think I feel I can answer. I would prefer that a European representative here to answer to question to European Union. Uh, anyway, I don't know by heart now. My Our uh, SDS uh, sustainable development scenarios um, uh, for Europe and how they compare to the others. So I would like not to take this question. Okay, that's clear. That's clear. Now, for well, one of the member states of the European Union, I, I can state that we are, we are looking, let's say, at uh, all kinds of measures to reduce the carbon emissions. So it, it's going through all sectors, and what we see, it will be a major, a major task uh, to achieve that. Originally, the European goal was forty uh, percent, and now through the Green Deal, it has been increased. To 55 percent so to achieve that in only 10 years it will be a major ta major task uh, for all of us uh, so we can do we can do a lot a lot better um, <clears throat> so um, I was uh, I have a lot of questions here so I would like to go back uh, to my list of questions um, so the uh, let's say it was already mentioned before the the COVID nineteen uh, issue yes that does that influence us and also <clears throat> let's say um, uh, on the life cycle let's continue now on the life cycle assessments um, le yeah so land use change has that been uh, incorporated in your uh, life cycle and assessment is that uh, Daniele I think in your um, system uh, uh, it is incorporated isn't it yes uh the land use change uh, we are not considering it in our model because uh, we trace the the at this moment we are tracking all the biomass used in the process and if it uh, originated in an area of deforestation or, or uh, suppressed uh, native vegetation, we, we don't accept this uh, biomass to generate credits and it's um, excluded. And, uh, but we are studying uh, to incorporate the other kinds of uh, land use change in the in the in our life cycle analysis but uh, this is not uh, an issue that is uh, con concluded yet we are uh, the, the researchers that uh, from imbrapa that uh, support us on this uh, team are studying uh, to to develop uh, some kind of methodology to incorporate it at our calculator Okay, so <clears throat> and the question that relates to this, it's about, let's say, um, <clears throat> renewable fuels and also policies for transport. Um, so in your system uh, with, with, let's say, the certificates, can electric vehicles also apply for this, uh, the same certificate? Sorry. 
So in the Renova Bio, you, you support low carbon fuels, but imagine someone comes with an electric car. Could they also apply for this, the same certificate? No, no, they can't uh, because the, the, the policy is, um, is for biofuels only. The, the, the way that Brazil uh, set it at this moment for uh, reducing the carbon intensity is from biofuel. It's not uh, from electricity yet. Uh, so uh, I think each country must uh, evaluate what their uh, best uh, potential uh, to contribute and uh, related to, to transportation matrix. Um, the, the, the Hanover BU established that uh, we are going to, to, to achieve our targets using only biofuels. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, thank you. So, <clears throat> so how does this go in, in other countries? Uh, it's especially, let's say, the integration of, of the biofuel policy and the transport uh, policy in general, where we are looking at also at electricity as a source for, for let's say, uh, renewable t transport and maybe even e-fuels yes, as an alternative for, for biofuels. So how, how is this integrated in, in other countries? Is there anyone who can say something about this? Yes, Stephanie? <laughs> sure. So, I mean, in our low carbon fuel standards, um, again, it's, you know, technology and, and feedstock neutral. So hydrogen fuels, electricity, um, it's always an all of the above approach um, to determine, you know, which will have the lowest carbon intensity. I mean, that's what you're looking for is just a low uh, carbon intensity um, fuel. So those are incorporated into the low carbon fuel standards. Um, something that's interesting because you mentioned, you know, how we can look at some of the uh, fuel policies um, as well. So in the US, we have um, what's called cafe standards. And um, we also have a number of, of different vehicle standards. And so I think what we're seeing in the US is indeed being closer to bringing those policies together so that we can drive a more consistent approach. We're not there yet. Um, but but thus far, you know, some of the policies are, are certainly uh, all of the above approach. You know, some maybe favor electrification in certain sectors a bit more, some uh, maybe the advantage will be towards biomass because of biomass based fuels, but that's going to be driven by, um, you know, the carbon intensity and the decarbonization of those fuels. But it's an interesting question because we do we're dealing with that in the US right now as well as we look at some of the um, some of the vehicle uh, policies that have been rolled back in the previous administration that we do think uh, will be taken up again. Okay, thank you. Yes, in the Netherlands, we are in the we are having the same approach where we look at all the different opportunities, and they all can count towards a low carbon transport system. But we also see that we cannot go at least at this moment, we cannot go without biofuels, because that's the fastest way uh, to reduce uh, carbon emissions from the transport sector. Okay, um, so to um, we have about uh, ten uh, ten minutes left. So um, yes, S Zoltan, uh, you would like to have the floor. I, I, let's say yeah. I, I want to give everyone one time more the floor. So this is an also your your final uh, possibilities to speak. Thank you. So uh, how best to decarbonize transport? I think that's the primary question here, and um, uh, there are two elements to it. Uh, one of them is the carbon intensity. So obviously it would need to be calculated in a life cycle uh, manner. And uh, uh, the other element to it is the cost. This second element is often overlooked. Uh, just uh, you can you can uh, see the what happened in France with the yellow vest uh, uh, movement. So uh, there was a, a, a climate measure increasing the price of 
of fuels at the pumps, but the general public uh, wouldn't tolerate it. And uh, so, uh, so uh, the cost element cannot be neg neglected. Otherwise, um, the popular support uh, will will be missing behind uh, behind uh, the measure. So, um, uh, if you look at the the carbon intensity and the cost element, these two amounts to a sort of metric which is called carbon abatement cost. And I think. Uh, this carbon abatement cost should be calculated for all the measures, and uh, be it uh, conventional biofuels, advanced biofuels, electromobility, renewable hydrogen, biogas, whatever. And um, obviously, you would want to pick the lowest cost technology, the lowest uh, carbon abatement cost measure, and then you want to scale it up. So I think that's that's the best way forward. And there are there are um, um, approaches already being taken, but uh, I would suggest the, that, for instance, the IEA uh, start calculating the carbon abatement cost and and make the comparison. And based on this metric, it can come up with uh, suggestions. And obviously, uh, there are some calculations already around, and and it shows that conventional ethanol is one of the lowest cost. So you would uh, you would want to suggest the uptake of this fuel, and um, uh, whether uh, considering the impacts. I think over the past decade or maybe two decades now. The, the early predictions, the worst fears uh, of negative impacts never materialized. So you could actually propose that uh, a similar trajectory, a similar growth is replicated in the upcoming decade. So you would be on the safe side. There would be uh, no unbearable uh, consequences. And all you would have is just the the climate benefits. So I think I think that's uh, that's one way to 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 go about uh, transport decarbonization from an economic point of view. Thank you. Thank you very much for these uh, these suggestions and also <clears throat> give some some way forward. And I think Paolo wants likes to answer this question. And so it's also for you your final words, uh, Paolo. Okay, I I just want to mention. Uh, calculating the carbon abatement cost is important, but you need to do it in a dynamic way. Now, I think you will all agree uh, that uh, solar photovoltaic so today is one of the cheapest electricity sources in the world. Now, if we had applied the carbon abatement cost to PV, and applied it in a technology neutral way 10 years ago, we would never be here. So we have on one hand to look at the carbon abatement cost, but in a dynamic way, identifying where there is a potential for cost reduction, and then have integrative other policy measures to support those technologies that have a big potential for improvement, but are still at an early maturity stage and need special support. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Paolo. <laughs> and so I think, uh, Stephanie, could you could you have you some uh, final words for this meeting? Sure. Well, they they won't be on uh, carbon prices. I I do think we are uh, inching closer, but I think we're going to have to depend on countries like yours and the Netherlands and others to uh, to to move us forward there before the U.S. Uh, heads down that path. Um, but, you know, I just think, as I've said, a post-COVID economic recovery is going to rely on innovation, and that innovation should come, is naturally coming from the bio-based economy. I, I strongly believe biotech is going to be a big driver in these efforts, whether they're decarbonization of transport, uh, manufacturing, or agriculture, which we haven't gotten to speak too much about today, but which is such a huge driver of our economies and can, you know, really should be seen as a as a helpful solution to so many of these challenges, um, since, you know, they provide a feedstock from everything um, from fuels to products to food. <laughs> and, um, and so I want to make sure that we, we make that point as well. Uh, so looking forward to continuing to have more of these conversations, I think uh, we'll have the opportunity to, to do so as we move forward. But thanks for having me on the panel.
Okay. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And also for your suggestion to, to discuss this further, uh, look at innovation, but also look at the agricultural sector where the bioeconomy actually is taking place and where our resources, the bio-based resources are, are produced. Yeah, still a lot to do, a lot to improve and also a lot of opportunities. Um, so for um, Sangeeta. Uh, thank you, Keith. Uh, yes, I I agree with all these panelists about the life cycle analysis, which is a very important aspect. So in addition to that, I would like to add one more component that is a net energy ratio, NER, which is also important to calculate how much energy input is there, how much you are taking it back. So these two, if we take measure for both any technology coming up, life cycle analysis and net energy ratio, so that would drive the and then market would drive definitely as because cost would be definitely the driving force. And as a Stephanie has Stephanie has said, the agriculture sector there is a lot of potential in so that bio economy and biofuel can contribute to uh, increase the farmers' income at least couple. So that is the major thing. And there is a with the advancement in biotechnology. There would be a lot of opportunities, breakthrough innovations can come up and can make uh, these different uh, scenario and which can contribute to boost the uh, biofuel and bio low carbon bioeconomy. So with this, I would look forward to have more such conversation coming up and India would look forward to have collaborations platform with the member countries or by future platform mission innovation, a technology collaboration program to biorefineries in order to take forward the bio, low carbon bioeconomy. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. That's indeed uh, something very good to work on and something we can we can do to jointly and together and to join our efforts. Thank you very much. <clears throat> so now, um, if we I can get the big screen uh, with all the pictures. Yes. Who is still there? Uh, yes, so Daniela, you, you are still there, yes. So, so um, what are your closing words? So thank you, Keith. Uh, I think uh, low carbon policies need to be con constantly evolving. Uh, and we are in a moment uh, of intense technological evolution and uh, we need to to be uh, prepared and uh, to to make uh, changes and uh, developments on our policies uh, to 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 find uh, the the best uh, way to to find results uh, and uh, i think uh, this is how we see at uh, amp uh, and uh, we are working hard to make uh, hanova bu uh, the best uh, policy we can do here in brazil uh, we, are we are we are we are facing these challenges and uh, we are uh, seeking uh, to 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 overcome uh, each one. So uh, thank you for the opportunity to be here and to share our experience in implementing Hanova BU. And uh, it was very interesting to, to, to know more about uh, what's happening in uh, other countries uh, in, in the same way uh, to, to, to to a low carbon bioeconomy. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Yes, indeed, <laughs> it was uh, very interesting to see uh, through all these different presentations how we are uh, developing uh, low carbon policies and in the bioeconomy. Um, while the title <laughs> was uh, the single most important policy for scaling up the low carbon uh, bioeconomy, I think this is a little bit uh, too much. Uh, we have learned a lot from each other. And what we see is that 
each uh, policy fits to uh, each specific situation. And we're also learning by doing. So we are building up these experiences and try to bring them further. We have got some very interesting suggestions, I would say. I think, first of all, it's very much about, let's say, um, now after COVID-19 uh, uh, to, to restart the, global, the globe in a more sustainable way, the request from society to do this in a sound and healthy way, uh, also to, to reduce carbon emissions. So this opens opportunities to realize uh, the, these uh, low carbon projects and <clears throat> also the low carbon bioeconomy can be part of that. And I think uh, what was mentioned, it's, it can come in through, for example, procurement. So the procurement by agencies, uh, by the government. So government, governmental bio-based procurement opens up a market. Uh, so this can be the market for the biofuels, but also for the bio-based chemicals uh, and the bio-based products. So really a lot can happen there. But at the same moment, we also see that this creates a lot of opportunities for innovation. Uh, biotech is very important to realize all these changes. So we need more and better knowledge uh, to get there. And so this innovation to do that jointly, I think is an important part of, of making this uh, <coughs> bioeconomy, low carbon bioeconomy uh, a success. So, so that leads, uh, let's say, a lot of, um, yeah, a lot of actions. We, we are not just ready here. We, we are not, uh, we have not defined the policy, but uh, that's why we have uh, the BioFuture platform. So uh, under the leadership of Renato, uh, we, we will proceed in, in, let's say, analyzing policies. Uh, the IEA is uh, doing the, the policy blueprint study and we are looking forward to get some very good results out of that and also with recommendations. And uh, this, uh, this uh, let's say, workshop, this seminar can feed into that. Um, so I'm very thankful to, uh, let's say, everyone who has given a presentation here, who joined the discussion, but also to our audience who have posted a lot of interesting questions. We have not been able to answer all the questions because it, it was quite a lot, uh, but we hope that we, to some extent we have answered all these questions. So I wish you all um, uh, a lot of success in realizing all these, uh, let's say, goals that we have ahead of us. And uh, thank you very much for your attention and uh, goodbye to all of you. Thank you very much, Case Quant, Paulo Frankel, Daniele, Stephanie, and Zoltan for this lively debate. There are a lot of aspects that you have touched upon here, and I get the impression that we could be still discussing this for many hours. There are many drivers to bioenergy, but karma mitigation is certainly the most important one in the next decades, as we have to find means to accelerate the energy transition. From this debate, it is clear that providing demand in a proper price in exchange for this mitigation potential is the single most important policy to accelerate the bioeconomy. From them, we find different instruments and different ways to quantify this potential, deal with impacts. Hopefully, the next versions of the policy blueprint will give us more insight on how to do it in the most efficient way possible. In the meantime, it is important to experiment, to implement, to act, Congratulations on the countries which are acting now. Thank you all for participating so far. It has been a long event. I hope this is just getting us started for the following two days of online conferencing with the BioN scientific webinar and dozens of poster sessions and the delivery of the prizes for the best submissions. We also look forward to have you in the full joint Be Best and BioFuture Summit conference in May next year in Sao Paulo. May you all have a good week. Thank you.
Quem tem uma empresa sabe quanto tempo é valioso. Por isso, a Pets Brasil apoia empresas brasileiras que querem exportar seus produtos, atrair investimentos estrangeiros ou empreender no exterior. Com a Pets Brasil, as empresas brasileiras têm um apoio estratégico para mandar seus produtos e serviços para fora do país de uma forma inteligente e segura. Com métodos inovadores, parcerias, soluções inteligentes, visão de mercado, conteúdos estratégicos e muita qualificação. A Apex Brasil é referência na promoção de exportações, internacionalização de empresas e atração de investimentos estrangeiros. A agência também atua de forma coordenada com atores públicos e privados em setores estratégicos, tanto para o desenvolvimento da competitividade das empresas quanto para o fortalecimento da economia brasileira. Se é conexão com o mundo de oportunidades no mercado internacional que a sua empresa procura, é o apoio da Apex Brasil que ela precisa. Acesse o mundo. Acesse Apex Brasil.